Oh, hello. Let's talk about Nora Roberts today, shall we? So if you will recall, at the beginning of 2021, I announced that I have undertaken a very long term reading project, which I am calling Reading Roberts. Take a look. It's in a book. A reading Roberts. I can be anything. Take a look. It's in a book. A reading Roberts. And this reading project is me trying to read every single book that Nora Roberts has ever written, which is ambitious, okay? There's, the woman writes a ton of books. I think I figured out when I was originally putting this together that she used to write up to seven to 10 books a year. Now, granted, a lot of those were like short contemporary category romance, but still, that is a tremendous number of books and she is still releasing them. So when I was going through, I wanna share some progress with you on this challenge. It's hard to quantify progress when it's an ever moving target because she is still releasing four books a year. So as I become aware of them, I'm adding them to my list. And so the number of things I have to read is ever growing. Now that is a blessing. I wish Nora Roberts a long, long happy life and hopefully she will continue writing well into her long happy life. But it does mean that I basically have a still growing pile of books that I am trying to get to. But what I thought we would do today is I'm going to start with some stats and then I'm going to cut to kind of a vlog. Really what I was trying to do throughout the year is whenever I finished a book, I was trying to give you like my immediate like little mini review of it. So this is basically going to be stats and then a bunch of small reviews of Nora Roberts books. Warning is that these will all be spoiler free reviews, but also I didn't always remember to film one. So this will not be for every Nora Roberts book I read in 2021, but it will be for most of them. So just caveat there. So let's dive into it. So to start off with some stats, here are all of the books from Nora Roberts or JD Robb that I read in 2021. And then this is the ratings breakdown. I definitely read some things that I really enjoyed and then some things were, that were just meh. I didn't hate anything that I read from her this year, but I definitely had ones that were not amazing. I think a highlight of this year is really getting into her very old category romances and finding that I still really enjoy them. They're from the 80s, so I wasn't sure how I was going to do with some of those because I'd only read, I think, one or two previously. And I'm finding that in general, I still enjoy them. They're not always like my favorites, but they're usually still pretty fun. So I think that's a testament to how clear and strong her actual writing is. This is a distribution of the age of the different books that I was reading from because she has written in five decades now. She started writing in 1981 and she is still writing today. So she has written in five different decades. She's sort of like the share of the bookish world. I would say of the books I read this year, these were my favorites and these were my least favorites. So when I first started tracking this last year, I had 258 books from her that I knew she had published that I was having as my TBR at that point. Um, that has changed and we'll talk about it. But at that time I had 258 books on my TBR and I had read 79 of them, which meant that I had read 30.6% of her books. And at the end of 2021, I had 266 books on the TBR. Some of those were new and upcoming releases. And then I think I found one or two that I had just missed. So I had added to that number and I had read 96 of them for a total percentage of 36.09% read by the end of 2021. Since then, I've already added a book <laughs> to what I know she is going to be coming out with in 2022. So that's already gone down. Love that for me. But at the end of the year, that's where I was with percent of the TBR read, meaning that I have a total as of the end of 2021 of 170 books left to read from her. Of those 170, I own 53 of them. So that is 31.8 1% of the books that I need to read from her, I already have either an E or physical form. So I have a nice backlog of them to keep working my way through. And as of the end of 2021, the average rating that I gave to a book 
from Nora Roberts or JD Robb was 3.6, which makes sense. That's slightly above what I would call a B plus. So maybe like B plus A minus ish. And there are many of her books that I love and give A's or A pluses to, but then there are definitely some that I'm giving like the equivalent of a C to. So that totally makes sense to me in terms of sort of the spread of rating. And in terms of just like a big highlight, I did do a Reading Roberts readathon at the end of July, which was really, really fun. I was uh, the first, that was the first sort of like readathon I've ever tried to host and I really enjoyed it. We did like a bingo board. Here was my final ending bingo board. Uh, it was just great times all around and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed doing that. I may or may not do that in 2022. I haven't decided but it was definitely a very positive experience for 2021. And yeah, I guess with that I will go ahead and throw you to all of my mini reviews. Again, no spoilers but just sort of like my thoughts about the books that I did read over the course of 2021. Alrighty, first Reading Roberts book in the books. That didn't sound right. First Reading Roberts book down. How about that? Um, so Faithless in Death. Uh, J.D. Robb is a pen name for Nora Roberts. And this was a really good entry in the In Death series. This is number 52, I believe. So very long running series. The last couple have been oh, like fine, but not my favorites in the series. And I think this was like, in terms of the mystery piece of it, much stronger than the last few have been. This is, I think, going to be one of sort of the landmark cases in the In Death verse, because there's like this big sort of like conspiracy that Eve is un covering. There's a couple of good character moments in here with um, Peabody and McNabb. They're going to be moving in with Mavis and Leonardo. So you know, that's like a fun little kind of character. That was a fun character moment. But overall, this was much more mystery focused than character focused. And I will say the the in depth books that are like stellar for me have a good balance of both. But the mystery in this was really, really good. And uh, I really enjoy it like kind of was about a cult. And I enjoy mysteries that have that element to it. So this really worked for me. I would give this one four stars. So I just finished up Legacy last night, which is the newest standalone thriller from Lenora this year. And okay, hmm. I very, I have very conflicted feelings about this book because in terms of just like the Nora Roberts, like cozy, read through it, just immersive, can't put it down vibe. I feel like this was a return to form for her from the last couple of books. So it felt more like a romantic suspense than they've felt in a while for the most... Mm, hmm, do I mean that? I think I mean that. Yeah, this one was more like had a little bit more romance integrated into it throughout. And also I think the suspense element was more present. So it felt a little less like, for instance, Hideaway last year. That one I think didn't feel as, it felt more just like sort of general fiction or like a coming of age story. This one felt like it had a few more of the kind of traditional romantic suspense beats to it. So I really enjoyed that. Like that piece of the book I liked, but there were two, well, there's a few things, but two main things that I felt like kept taking me out of the story. And I think drove it from being like a four star book to being like a three and a half star book. First is I happen to be somebody who is a social media influencer. So some of the things like the heroine's profession is basically to be a fitness influencer. And some of the stuff with how she was portraying the technology pieces and like how some of that works, it just didn't, <laughs> it didn't ring true to me at all. So I think this is probably how, you know, like I also feel this often when there's tech backdrops in books, I'm like, mm, that's not really quite how this works because that's my day job. But it was such a big, like I can usually let it go if it's just sort of a side note, it ended up being such a big part of the story. It kept taking me out because I was like, wait, you're supposed to be super successful, but your video only got 200 views in the first hour. Like my videos get like three to 500 views in the first hour. Like that doesn't make any sense. So there are things like that that just kept like taking me out of the story. The other thing is because she is a fitness influencer, I did feel like there was a lot of sort of subtextual toxic diet culture stuff being woven in. And again, and if it was just sort of in the background, I probably could have just ignored it. I think it was meant to be well-meaning. Like, I think it was well-meant, but I think it was perpetuating a lot of obsessive 
ways of like basically what I saw happening and I just don't think the book ever really addresses this is that the main character's mother gives her an eating like disordered eating or like a very disordered way of thinking about eating and exercise <laughs> I don't know I just didn't love those parts of the book and if again if they had been more in the background I probably could have just rolled with it but it was a really big part of what was going on so all of that dinged it down from a four to a three and a half for me in terms of the actual like suspense part I actually quite liked that and I, as always I loved the small town feels and there was like renovation happening and their own family and all of that like all of that really worked for me it was just really the things around the heroine's job in this one that kept distracting me so three and a half stars for it did enjoy but not my favorite of her romantic suspenses um so yeah that's where I'm at with that I'm gonna go feed these kitties because they keep rubbing up on my ankles Alrighty guys, so I finished this uh, the day after I started it. So I read most of the day on Sunday and then I finished this off on my lunch break on Monday. And I enjoyed this definitely more than any other Paranora I have ever read. Meaning that it's not my favorite from her, but I wonder if because my expectations were pretty low, <laughs> I ended up quite liking this one. And I did identify what it is about Paranoras I don't love. I think it's that they tend to have a lot of POVs and I think her writing is much better suited to a dual POV as opposed to a multi POV because we don't get enough time to fully sink into and enjoy the main characters and therefore some of the kind of like cheesier elements I think end up standing out more in the multi POV. Also Nora's magic systems are incredibly soft. Like there's not a lot of hard world building in Involved, which I'm okay with at this point because like I know that going into it but I think for a lot of people that won't really work and for me I think if I'm in the right mood for that it can be fine but there's a lot of like going with itness that is required for the magical components also the pandemic pieces of this were like honestly too real they were definitely much more extreme than what we've experienced in 2020 and 2021. But especially when it was talking about like supply hoarding, just like general chaos, I was like, okay, yeah, that's hitting a little close to home. So anyway, probably realistically, it should be more of a three and a half. But I think because I was just excited that I was enjoying a Paranora, I'm going to give it some extra kind of bonus points for that. Alrighty, so I did finish Irish Thoroughbred Up and this was kind of a pleasant surprise. I wasn't sure what to expect with this because you just never know with an early 80s category romance exactly what you're gonna be getting into. But I'm pleased to report that this actually I think is a lot more readable than most of the other romances from that era that I have read for like history of the genre kind of purposes. I had a decent time in this. Like I think you can definitely see Nora's you know, sort of proto tropes that she's going to use a lot. Uh, I think her like really readable prose is kind of there from the jump, which surprised me. And yeah, there's definitely more sort of like alpha holeness in this one because it's a category in 1981. But actually, in comparison to other ones I've read from this era, it's actually pretty chill. <laughs> So uh, kudos to Nora for uh, one of her sort of legacies to the genre in general was having a less amped up hero and getting more of a perspective from the hero. I don't think she was the first one to do that, but I think she really popularized having the dual perspective as opposed to just having the heroine's perspective. I think you can see some some of the kind of roots of that. So I would say this was pretty successful. I mean, I gave it three stars. It's, you know, it has an attempted assault that I did not necessarily have a great time in. The hero definitely is far higher handed with the heroine than my taste would typically gravitate towards. But overall, for its time, for what it is, I think it's pretty solid. So better of a success with this than I would have expected. Oh my gosh, guys, I just realized that I <laughs> checked in for the last four Roberts that I read because I read a ton of them for the Roberts Readathon. So, okay, first up, the one I have in physical form is Search for Love. It's in this bind up with Pride and Passion. And this is a, I believe it was like an 83 category romance with this woman who is the like long lost daughter of like a French, what was he? He was a French count and or not. So her, 
let me rephrase that. She's a long lost granddaughter of the Dowager Countess, who is a French countess or like a Bret, she's in Breton. So she's a Breton countess, but she, the countess, this was like a second marriage. So from her second husband's line is how the countage is passing. And so they are technically cousins, our main character Serenity and do homeboy who's the hero, but not really because they have no blood relation. So as soon as you see that, you're like, oh, okay, you guys are gonna fall in love because this is a category romance. And this is like, not the best Roberts. It was very like, over, it just reminded me a lot of the 80s categories that I've read. Um, there were some points about it that I did enjoy. Like, it wasn't like it was unreadable. There were, like, little moments of Nora Roberts' flair, but our heroine in particular is just, like, a lot to deal with. <laughs> um, but she's a painter. Her father was a famous painter. Her father, like, stole her mother away from the castle or whatever. I don't know. It was a lot. There's also, like, a semi-forced seduction scene at the very end, and that's just never my favorite. Anyway, it was not my favorite Nora Roberts, one of my lesser Nora Roberts reads. It was okay, but I'd give it two stars. Then, um, what else did I read? I read The Villa, which was fantastic. I gave that four and a half stars. It is like so sudsy and dramatic and wonderful. It feels like Dynasty, but in the early 2000s in a Napa Valley winery. And it's all about like you know, family loyalty, but somebody is trying to like undermine the family business. And there is there well, there are two romances in this one with kind of the current generation, like the youngest generation of the family of the Gimbellis and the McMillans, uh, who again, are kind of like faux cousins because their grandparents got married, but they have no blood relation. So theme. Uh, so they are one of the people like sets of people getting together. But then also our heroine Sophie, Sophie, Sophie's mom is also having a romance with the new COO. And so we kind of have two romances going on. There is like a suspense plot because like people are getting murdered, seemingly trying to like screw over their business. So there's a little bit of a suspense plot engine, but it really reaches sort of like intergenerational family melodrama. Uh, and it was just very soapy and fun. Like it was just a really good time. I had a really fun time reading that one. So definitely the hit of the Roberts Readathon. Then what else did I read? Oh, I read Vision in White, uh, which is a not a just like a straight up contemporary romance. It's the first in her bridal quartet. And it is about four friends who run a wedding business together. They each have like different jobs within the wedding business. And our first heroine, Mac, is the photographer for their business. And she is so just like, it's competency point porn, like mwah, like that really good competency porn that Nora Roberts does with her protagonist professions. Like it just was really fun to read about their business. And um, she connects with somebody she knew in high school because his sister is getting married at their business. His name is Carter. He's like an English professor. He's like very nerdy, very beta. And he's like probably the most chill Nora Roberts hero I've ever read. He was adorable. Like he's the star of the show for me in that book. It had the typical like toxic mom trope of Nora Roberts. That is something that she does a lot. And then it also had like, what else did it had have? It had, I mean, it had a lot of her sort of like tip, like tricks. I don't know that the romance was like super compelling, but I just loved Carter so much that I gave it four stars because I just really, it was just fun. It was a really fun contemporary from her. Definitely looking forward to finishing that series. And then, oh, one more. Oh, Summer Desserts. This is another category, I think from 85. And this one, is with a woman who is like this world renowned pastry chef. Uh, and she is like the height at the height of her profession. And this dude who wants to hire her for his hotel chain and like make his hotel in Philadelphia, like sort of a, a destination for eating. It is so over dramatic, but it was really fun. And you know, you get the alternating point of view with the hero, which is very unusual for the that time period. I don't know if she was the first person to do it, but she was definitely the popularizer of not just having the heroine's point of view, but getting an alternating point of view. So that was really cool to see that so early on. And for an 80s category, this hero was very arrogant, but he was not 
alpha, really, which I just thought was refreshing. It was just a, yeah, I don't know. It had a little bit of drama, a little bit of give and take, but it was mostly just pretty chill, uh, which I just, I love that about Nora Roberts books. They're always so cozy. So I wouldn't call it like one of her best, but I think especially for a 1980s category, very readable, very fun, um, surprisingly chill about the topic of infidelity. Uh, and yeah, it was a good one. So that, I think... That, I gave that one three stars, by the way. That rounds out what I read for the Roberts Readathon. So yay. Okay, checking in with two additional books I have read. This is a bind up with Temptation and The Best Mistake. I actually really enjoyed both of these. They're both categories. Temptation is from 87. And then The Best Mistake I see with its published date as 94, but then I've also seen it as 87. So I don't know. But I think these are roughly from the same period of category romance writing that Lenora was engaged in. Temptation, I probably preferred to The Best Mistake, but I did actually, I gave, I think I gave Temptation three and a half stars and I gave The Best Mistake three. So Temptation, what I liked about it was was that we have this young woman who is a socialite or was a socialite in Philadelphia. Her father died revealing like all of these gambling debts and her society fiance jilts her. Her like basically she has almost no money left. So she has to sell pretty much everything that they have left to pay the creditors. And then she has a little bit of money left and she's investing it in the summer camp with her childhood best friend. And so like they have to make this work for her to not be SOL. So we have her Eden um, at the summer camp. She is teaching the girls how to ride horses. It's kind of, it's clearly meant to be sort of like an upper crusty kind of girls sleepaway camp. And it is adjoining the property of the Elliot Apple Orchard, which is run by none other than Mr. I think Chase, is that his name? Yeah, Chase Elliot himself. And love ensues from there. I just really love the writing of this one, especially, I keep saying this, but for categories of this time period, I'm really finding Nora Roberts writing to be a cut above. And it's making it clearer and clearer to me why she was the author or like one of the authors from that era who really like progressed in her career long term because the writing is just really, really good, I think, for kind of just like contemporary genre fiction. It's very nice. The characterization is nice. And her heroes definitely have asshole moments. They always do because that's just like a part of the time period. But they very rarely go too far to so where I'm just like, oh, I just don't like you. I can't even just like you at all because you're too much of an asshole. So that was definitely the case here. I really liked Eden had this nice like give it to him moment to both Chase and to her ex fiance. That was very satisfying. And overall, like I just, I haven't read a lot of romances set at a summer camp and I thought that was a fun setting. So I really liked Temptation a lot. And then the best mistake, I think I would have liked a little better if it wasn't quite as insta lovey as it was. It's much shorter than Temptation. This one was only like 90 pages. So it's sort of like a short story. And it's a single mom trope where our single mom is an ex model. She's bought a house that has like a apartment unit in it. So she is renting that out as a part of a way to support herself and her son Keenan, and a local sports columnist moves into that unit and he starts getting more and more involved in their daily life. He really bonds with Keenan and love ensues from there. Like I said, it felt a little insta love for me, and then like he does definitely have a big jerk moment towards the end. But I, I again, I like that our main character, Zoe, I believe, she is not putting up with bullshit. So I liked that and I appreciated the way that she had like about like clear boundaries of like, I am in love with you, but I'm not asking anything of you and you are acting like I am and that is you being a real dickwad. So I liked that bit. So overall, both of these were really, really fun. Like I said, three and a half for Temptation, Best Mistake, three stars all around. I liked both of these. Uh, category romances from Nora quite a bit. So I'm gonna hold on to this little bind up. Alrighty, checking in with two more reads. And I actually read both of the entries in the DC Detectives duology that Nora Roberts has. First one is Sacred Sins and the second one is Brazen Virtue. I actually personally preferred Sacred Sins, but I read them Brazen Virtue first and then Sacred Sins. You don't have to read them in order. I think that was fine. I wish now that I'd read them in the right order. But anyway, I read this one first because I had it physically and because 
this is going to be an adaptation with Alyssa Milano sometime in the next couple of years. So I wanted to make sure that I read it before that comes out. And feelings about this are somewhat mixed. So these books were released in 87 and 88. And so they are clearly early in Nora Roberts career and early in her career of writing kind of like romantic suspense type books. I think for being early efforts in that they're actually pretty darn good. And I think they're actually quite readable even good lord 35 ish coming up on 35 years later, which I think for genre fiction is pretty impressive. Um, genre fiction has purposefully got kind of a shelf life to it. It is purposely very of its time and of its moment. So the fact that it's still very enjoyable, I think is really to her credit and says a lot about her as a storyteller and a craftsperson. But Brazen Virtue, I definitely liked less because it did feel more of its time. And those elements did ding it down for me. So the setup for this is that there are two sisters, one of whom is a successful writer, the other of whom is getting out of a marriage to a very successful lawyer trying to get custody of her son back but knows that she's going to have kind of an uphill battle because he is very successful in the legal field. And so to supplement her teacher's income, she has become a sex worker, specifically a phone sex worker. And I think that there are just some very retrograde attitudes towards sex work in this. Now, to be fair, I actually think this is much more sex worker positive than I would have expected for a book at this time. Like the character in question does get a lot more empathy and the other sex workers who are involved in the murders because this does become basically like a serial killer type story where somebody is targeting these phone sex operators to murder them. And so it's a serial killer story. We do get I think pretty sympathetic portrayals of those women for the time. I just think in particular the heroine's sister who is the first one that is killed. It's like it's tarnished by the fact that she is also portrayed as being a bad mother in the vein of a Nora Roberts bad mother. And so I think it kind of it veers into some like victim blaming around like domestic abuse that made me a little uncomfortable. So like overall I enjoyed the story but I think some of the characterization moments just fell flat for me in the context of somebody being the victim of a murder. So anyway I do I actually still did find this pretty enjoyable. I also really like the hero in this one. His name is Ed and we meet him in the first book. He's like this 6'5 big burly ginger policeman who's renovating the house next door to to the sister who's murdered. And so the sister who's visiting meets him. I don't know that I found the, that was the other thing. I, I don't know that I found their ultimate like happily ever after wholly convincing. So that was the other part of this that didn't fully work for me. But this was incredibly readable. Like I said, I think it holds up very well for a piece of genre fiction of its time. And uh, I did ultimately enjoy this not an all time favorite, but one that I did enjoy. And I will say the book before it in the duology that I also read was Sacred Sins and that I liked a lot better. Now it took a while for me to get into it but I really liked the way that the mystery in this one is handled and where it ultimately goes. So basically what's happening in this is that there is a serial killer who is serial killing women in DC who are blonde and he is killing them with like a priest like sh scarf thing. It's called I think an amicus or an amis ritually strangling them and then like doing a last right kind of thing. So I thought that for a serial killer thriller that was a really kind of like enjoyable angle on it. And also since I did some research recently on the history of serial killer thrillers, I will also mention that I think that these both of these books are actually early examples of romantic suspense serial killer books. I wonder if that's part of how Nora Roberts got so popular as if she was one of the first people doing this kind of story. Because really that kind of book took off in 81 with Red Dragon from Thomas Harris. And these came out in 87 and 88. Silence of the Lambs came out in 88. So it seems like that was sort of like a hot trend in thrillers. And I think I, I wonder now if essentially her bringing that trend to romantic suspense was part of what like helped her really stand out from the crowd. Aside from the fact that her writing I think is just like a cut above and she's very good at crafting like suspense type stories. So anyway, all that to say I really really like the serial killer aspect of this. This is a little bit of like hate to love because the hero is a police detective who's sort of like an anti-science misogynist. I wasn't wild about him. But I really like the heroine who was essentially like a psychologist who's brought in to sort of give a light profile on the serial killer. And I really liked 
her a lot and I liked her journey and kind of how the story developed. I will say that their dynamic actually reminds me a lot of even Rourke from Naked and Death, except that it's essentially gender swapped. And I think that the dynamic works for me better when the dynamic is gender swapped. With all that being said, I actually really like Sacred Sins. I liked it better than Brazen Virtue, which I was not expecting because I'd heard more about Brazen Virtue. And uh, I'm excited to read more of these like really early romantic suspenses from her because I think these are the earliest ones that I've read so far. So definitely some of its time elements, but overall, I think like really successful for me. Alrighty, so those were my reviews. And so yeah, we're in 2022. The project rolls on. Reading Roberts continues. As of the beginning of this year, I am at 267 books total that I need to get through for a total unread of 171. I have still only read 96 of them as of this particular filming for a total percent read of 35.96% of the TBR. Total books that I own is 56% of those 171, so I own 32.75% of the books that I need to still get to. So we will check in again. I mean, you will see how I feel about these books throughout the year, but we will check in again next year to talk about how progress has continued on this particular challenge. So let me know if you've read any Nora Roberts below. If so, what your favorites or least favorites are. And yeah, I think that will do it for me. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social needs if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. And I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today. And I will just talk to you soon. Bye!